Um, since it's a nice small group, feel free to interrupt, ask questions, do anything at any time. So I am Meredith Gudowitz and I am in the physical therapist assisting department. So that's where I'm hiding. My doctorate is in physical therapy, but what I bring to you is my background in exercise physiology. So I'm through the American College of Sports Medicine. I'm a certified exercise physiologist. And when I was asked to present this topic, I was asked to share on my original research on this topic. And I said, that's nice, we can do that, but we're gonna make it relevant to all of you as well. So I have a bit of a mix of things. So how many of you are familiar with heart rate variability? A little bit. What um, context did it come up in? Like anatomy and physiology. Perfect, so that's the context it came up in. And I saw someone. Yeah, well, just mainly at the gym, the trainer I used to have, uh, we just emphasized this burst of energy, or really that you could choreoize. I thought maybe this might be something along similar lines, but I don't know. Perfect, I'm glad you bring that up. We will most certainly tie it in. So this whole project, we published a research study in 2021, I believe we were finally published. My research was done in 2018. And this whole thing started as a nightmare. Actually, it was more of a dream. And if you do research, it becomes a nightmare, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I literally woke up one morning and I had this pile of paper and, and crayons, actual crayons. And I just started drawing out stuff. And I was like, wouldn't this be the coolest research study? And there were like all these different branches going into each other about this heart rate variability concept. And I bring it to my boss and I say, can we do physical therapy directed research? We were doing medical research. This was up in Minnesota, out of Twin Cities Orthopedics where this project was actually funded. And I brought it to him and I hand him this pile of crayon paper. He goes, that's nice. Can you make that linear? <laughs> so I said, all right. I got back to him for the next day, I showed him an outline proposal for a huge research project. We thought it was gonna take one year, it took three years, but it was gonna be a randomized controlled trial. And it was gonna be their first physical therapist-led study ever. And it got green-lighted. And then it turned into this mammoth three-year nightmare that finally got published in 2021. <laughs> so I'm gonna share some of that with you. Let's see, once I figure out how to operate my mouse, right? First of all, it's February. This is Heart Health Month. Mm -hmm. I wear red to honor heart health. I present this to honor heart health. And the CDC current statistics off of 2022, no, COVID is not actually the leading cause of death. It is still heart disease. It's a little shocking to think that it claims one person every 34 seconds. This is like the college initiation lecture where you say, look to your right, look to your left, realize half of you aren't going to be here in five years. And it's really scary to think that in the real world, we could actually have the same conversation and say, one of you is going to have cardiovascular disease diagnostically. A little scary. Now the cool thing, almost all of it is lifestyle mediated. So that means that most of the time, people are under their own locus of control to change how fast they move into these statistics. Not all of them but many times. And wouldn't it be amazing if I had some way to know, am I accelerating on the path towards statistics or accelerating on the path away from statistics? And right now we don't have a tool that we commonly talk about that tells us that. Now here's where it gets interesting. Here's my little chart. So we're talking about what HRV is, there could be a lot of interpretations. We talk about why it actually matters. Talk about some original research that I actually did. And then I'm going to show you what your cell phone might be trying to tell you. And if you teach students in anatomy and physiology, many of their cell phones are trying to tell them this. And it works this way. First of all, what is this thing? 
and there's some people. Your EKG. This is the duration between the R intervals. So we think, like all of us think, that our heart operates like this. Boom, 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 boom. We're like, okay, 60, 6 beats a minute, whatever that is. We know what a heart rate is. The reality is that's not what happens. It's more like syncopated. But here's a challenge. Milliseconds, not seconds. So you can hear me clap the different beats because those are in seconds. But in milliseconds, I need some technology that can tell me that. And not just one point in time, it's going to have to be some kind of an average to have some meaning to it. Second thing, it's a sign of an autonomic balance between the central nervous system. What does that mean? So, my a &P people, what does that word even mean? Autonomic balance. Balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic plane. Exactly. So it's the balance between your fight or flight response and your rest and digest response. And you might say, well, I know if I just ate a meal. I know if there's a snake chasing me, I hope. But <laughs> our body, do I really? And we know that higher variability in most cases is thought to be better. There's sometimes that's not true. Like if you have AFib, atrial fibrillation, um, a variation in your heartbeat, that's not true in your context. But most of the time, this is true. So where does this magic high HRV telling me I'm in balance live? Most of the time, people say, well, I did yoga. I meditated. I read a book. I did my stress relief practices. So yeah, I'm great now. I'm all nice and relaxed. Well, guess what? High HRV, this good magic thing we're aiming for, actually doesn't live there. It lives in between the fight or flight running from the snake and in between the meditation, rest, and digest mode. And you might say, okay, I know how to get myself into those modes. I can alter my breathing. I can do these practices to de-stress. I can drink my cup of coffee to get amped up in the morning. You're like, no, I'm good, I'm good. Guess what? Maybe, maybe not. Because that number is influenced by a whole lot of things that you haven't considered yet. Psychological state. So are you stressed out? And I'm not just talking bad stress, I'm talking good stress. Mm -hmm. So let's say you just went to a wedding and you just went to this great celebration and you just got a new car and you just got a new house. Your stress level, your HRV, boom, down to the ground. And in this case, down to the ground, it's not good. You like high HRV. And you might say, well, life is good. Look at all this amazing stuff around me that I really want and I've really worked hard for. I really want to celebrate this. I'm on top of the world. And then the next week you get sick. Like how, how is that even possible? Like how did I just crash when the world was great? It's right here. Everything else affects it too. So physical, good exercise. Well, what kind of exercise? We know exercise helps your cardiovascular health, but should it be yoga? Should it be running? Should it be interval training? I don't know, I'm not really sure. We just know exercise, right? There's CDC guidelines saying, I need to accumulate my 300 minutes, but it doesn't tell me what to do. Your nutrition and your hydration. Should I drink a gallon of water a day? Should I drink a cup of water a day? Probably neither actually, something in the middle. It's influenced by the environment. So right now, when I had all the students come back right after the pandemic, we realized something. I realized it fast. I would change the lighting. I would change the rate of the PowerPoints. And they were having a meltdown. Like, what is going on with you guys? So I went around the room and I said, just tell me what you've been doing the past six months. They were all like out of the movie I Am Legend, basically. They'd been in isolation. They controlled the rate of their lights. They didn't look at a PowerPoint. They controlled the rate at which people spoke to them because basically they didn't speak to anybody. And it was like, then they're gone. And all of a sudden I said, well, you're gonna have to share this environment. This cannot be an individual environment. 
And guess what? Two weeks later, pretty much all of them got sick. And I'm not sure it's because we brought them all together as much as I think we tanked their HRV because everything around them was new and scary and not to their personal. Your body position changes it. Who am I supposed to measure those things standing up, running, lying down? And the circadian rhythm changes it. What if you've adapted for night shift? Oh, interesting. So you're trying to measure a moving target. And it's not just one moving target. Everything you're doing right now is affecting the structure. Every single thing. So how am I supposed to measure a moving target that won't stop? central nervous system says, hey, you know, I know life is good, but I need a break. Your HRV goes down. So it goes, hey, life is bad. I need a break. It goes down. And you're like, I don't know. It goes down. There is a way to measure the amount of anatomic control that we are looking at here. Anatomic. You put words in my, you put words in my head before this presentation. <laughs> uh, anatomic, explosion. Anatomic. possession of it right now. And if you are not, I guarantee you some of your students are in possession of this. Mm -hmm. So how many of you have one of these things? A Whoop, an Aura, an Apple Watch, a Fitbit, a Garmin, anything like that? Okay, perfect. Which one do you have? A Garmin. You have a Garmin. Okay. It's like the one I don't have on the board, but it isn't. It's valid. It's up there. Okay, Garmin. So in health and fitness, the number one health and fitness trend, and it's been like this for years in the U.S., it's wearable technology. And it is saying things to you. You ready to decode what it's trying to say? It's probably sunk to your phone, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of the time they're sunk to a phone. I'm gonna tell you what these cell phones that are attached to these devices are trying to say. But before we get there, get to know who I am. Why does it matter? Well, if I have insights into something that maybe I didn't even realize was already potentially in your possession, why wouldn't I want to change my statistics? Why wouldn't I want to walk away from adding to the statistic of more heart disease for me? Like, Do any of you want to sign up right now and say, I would like more heart disease, please? And if you say that, I have a lot of questions for you. Now here's the challenge. When I first presented this at Twin Cities Ortho, and I said, hey, can we do this project? You know, why don't you just measure their resting heart rate? Why don't you just measure their blood pressure? Isn't that easier? And I said, well, no, there's a little problem. It doesn't correlate to any vital sign we know about. It doesn't correlate to heart rate. It doesn't correlate to blood pressure. It actually doesn't even correlate to your rate of perceived exertion. So we can't go off of how you feel. We can't go off of a known vital sign. This is a different vital sign. This is the this syncopated rhythm of your heart going on in milliseconds. I need something else. And I said, huh, interesting. So we did the research in 2018. We published in 2021. You see this sharp curve in 2010? In 2010, the whole world started taking interest in this topic, and they said, hmm, Maybe this forgotten about science way back from the 1970s, maybe it's worth something to us. And more and more studies started being published. And now it's a big pet, 2,000 a year being published on heart rate variability. So I don't think this topic is going away. I don't think the interest in this vital sign is going away. And you might say, well, what is, what are they researching? What are they looking at? A lot of things medical. We're looking at it to predict cardiovascular disease. That's interesting. So yeah, there is something to saying I don't want to sign up for more cardiovascular disease. It offers me a new data point, one that maybe I haven't thought about. It's kind of like saying, you hear that hypertension is a silent killer or contributes to strokes, those are silent killers. Just because you don't know your number doesn't mean it's not changing your life. It is. It's just a matter of whether you know it or not. 
we are looking at it for survival prognosis after heart failure, heart attack, and coronary artery bypass grafts. And they're monitoring patients that are in acute situations right after these conditions. And they realize that if they see the HRV go way up, they want some crash carts for that, which is not going to be a good thing. And they're also using it to measure uh, or monitor for certain sudden cardiac death in NICUs and hospitalized patients. So kind of interesting to ask. So following that with a high heart rate variability shows that the heart's actually struggling to reestablish its normal rhythm or yes. It not necessarily rhythm, because mm -hmm. you might be looking at it and being like, okay, they're still 78 beats per minute, that's just them. It's showing that the autonomic nervous system is failing. Mm -hmm. And if your autonomic nervous system fails, what happens to every other system in your body? Mm -hmm. Every other system will fail if that system goes under. So it's really interesting because they're saying we're not seeing it on the heart rate. We are seeing it before somebody throws a PVC on us. Mm -hmm. But they're saying the nervous system isn't keeping up. There's going to be a problem. Are we sure what to do about the problem? No, not exactly. But we're saying, okay, medical team, high alert. That's going to be a problem. So we're looking at it on the other side too, fitness and performance. And this is how my interest came about in doing this research. So we're aligning exercise intensity dose based on your HRV each day. We're saying, where are you at in this fight or flight versus rest and digest balance? And how can I decide what you're going to do in the gym right now, or whatever your workout source is, to match where you are to make sure that you improve, in this case, that's go lower, <laughs> instead of jump up higher. Because if I keep sending you into this high spiral, I'm gonna spit out like cortisol and all kinds of things that you don't want elevated for long periods of time because that's going to create more cardiovascular disease if I just leave it unchecked in this pattern of go, go, go. So caffeine, High intensity workout, caffeine, high intensity workout, caffeine, high intensity, that's not gonna work then. So we're looking at it for fitness enthusiasts, we're looking at it for athletes, and I said, well, there's nothing published on dancers, so let's study them too. So there's a little bit more to that story. So what did I do, what did I research? This is the actual published study, it was in the Journal of Dance Medicine and Science, given that we chose dancers. And is matching exercise intensity to heart rate variability a key for effective conditioning for a dancer in a prospective randomized control trial? If you ask me what I published, I'm like, it was an HRV study on dancers. <laughs> but huge key into this three years. And why did I study this? How did I even come up with this dream nightmare that got drawn, drawn in crayon and then submitted and somehow turned into a research study? Well, interesting story. So top corner, does anybody know what that rash is? That's Lyme disease? That's Lyme disease. Okay. So you might say, hmm, let's go and get bit by a tick and we get this as Lyme disease. How did I even get the idea that HRV was a good idea to look at? One of my colleagues, he was really into it. Like really into it, had met somebody who was really into it and not really into it. I said, okay. He was doing more exercise training and he was a somatic coach. So he's trying to teach people to regulate their autonomic nervous systems from outside sources. So he's like, well, if I can measure it, isn't that going to be better? And he had a monitor on himself. He was actually using BioForce HRV, which is what we used in this study, which was one of the more original American versions off of the original design of Omega Wave, which was Eastern Bloc. And he had all this data, and his HRV was just really elevated for a few days, actually a few weeks. And he just goes, I don't feel well. Okay, how don't you feel well? I just don't feel well. So he took it to a couple different doctors and said, I don't feel well. And guess what the doctor said? <laughs> I don't know why you don't feel well. Get more sleep. Not sure. Okay. And he kept tracking his HRV and he goes, well, something's going really wrong. And he finally went to another doctor. And this was, um, in Minnesota we have naturopaths that practice, in addition to our allopathic doctors. So he took it to a naturopathic doctor and he showed them the data. He said, look, something's wrong with my nervous system. And she said, well, what, what have you tested so far? Bring me everything, bring me all your data, bring me all your labs. 
And she goes, has anybody tested you for Lyme disease? Because in that region, it's really common, actually. And he goes, no, nobody's tested me for that yet. And guess what? That was his diagnosis. But he doesn't recall ever having one of those rashes. He just didn't feel good. And he brought the doctor some more data and said, something is wrong with my nervous system. Lyme's disease affects the nervous system. And all of a sudden, she said, huh, yeah, nobody's, nobody's really tested this. So they did a um, course of, I believe it was tetracycline antibiotic, and he started feeling a lot better. And he started taking more interest in this. Now he's training people, and many of these people have a weight loss goal. And he started tracking all of them. And he said, well, what if I match exercise intensity to where you're at today? Okay, so I decide whether you go low intensity or whether you go high intensity or whether you go something in the middle based off of your HRV. Okay, and guess what? Clients that were stuck on this weight loss plateau, they couldn't get off of that. And guess what he did? He fixed it. He fixed the problem. He moved the scale. He said, I'm going to match your intensity instead of saying you go high intensity all the time, or you just need to burn more calories. And when he couldn't fix it, he took it another route. He went into nutrition sensitivity testing. And he said, you know, I'm matching your exercise intensity. It's been four weeks, nothing is moving. Let's test for this other thing that the medical world, some of them believe in it wholeheartedly, and some of them don't believe in it. It exists. Whether we want to believe or not believe, it doesn't matter. But then he got into nutrition sensitivity testing, changed their nutrition plan to match whatever that test was saying. And then, guess what? The scale started budging. So he started having this wild amount of success with people that were really, really on the stretch. And he was telling me all these stories as we're going along. So no wonder I wake up at two o'clock in the morning and I'm like, hey, let's study HRV. <laughs> Why not? That's all I've been hearing about all day. Kind of like a tonic. Like, whoa, you talked about atomic stuff. Now I'm talking about atomic stuff. No, actually, I'm talking about anatomic stuff. And I thought, you know, there's got to be a way that we can train smarter and not harder, quite literally. Not just the cliche, but like, literally, there has to be a way to know when my central nervous system is sitting on the ground and screaming out for help, even though life might look great on the surface, or maybe life doesn't look good on the surface. So, HRV, maybe it's a missing piece. So why did I pick cancers to study? Well, I happen to be seeing a lot. They were just coming into my clinic in droves. Like 80% of my caseload at 20 patients a day were dancers. I'm like, why are they all coming to me? And yeah, I have a dance background, but that doesn't make me any, anything special in the therapy world, right? I'm a physical therapist, I'm a dancer. Okay, so you're coming to me and you're all injured. Like lots of you are injured, hundreds. And I started doing some outreach just on injury prevention to some of the different schools in the area. And it's a pretty big area. It's like a three hour drive everywhere. And I started doing all these outreaches and I would just ask the students. And these teams are huge. These teams are like 75 dance team dancers regulated by the Minnesota State High School League Sports Association. And I would just have them sit on the floor and say, how many of you have an injury right now that's stopping you from performing at your best? And that's just how I defined injury. Something that's stopping you from performing at your best, a physical ailment, 100% of them would raise their hands. Every single school I went to, and I went to a lot of schools, it's like so roughly 5,000 of you are injured right now. That's a lot of people to be injured. And they were all coming into physical therapy. If they were close by, I was like, why are you taking up my whole caseload? I love you guys, but that's a lot. That's a big proportion of the population. And I talked to their coaches. What are you guys doing for conditioning? 15 to 30 hours a week. Practicing 15 to 30 hours a week. Yeah, plus weekend competitions. Kids ever get a day off? No. No. You do Saturday, you do Sunday, you do like every day. Oh yeah, three to five hours a day, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. Hmm, interesting. And the coach just said, the dancers need to run and condition more. And at some point, when the Minnesota School, uh, Minnesota State High School League caught wind of this, the president calls me up on the phone. He's like, hey, you got your marriage to list? I'm like, Maybe, what do you have to say next? And he goes, I need you to present at a big conference to all the coaches. He's like, I think we have a problem. Like, what's the problem? Like, the 
dancers are overwhelming the athletic training rooms and the athletic trainers need to get this sport and this sport and this sport and this sport all done in one day and the dancers are taking up all my resources. I can't hire two athletic trainers. Injury prevention. It's like, well, injury prevention doesn't really work. And he's like, what are you talking about? I said, if I add exercise to exercise, I create a problem, even if it's the best exercise on the planet. So adding more exercise, and that's all they want to do, that's not really helping me out. And so I did talk to them, but I talked to them about things like balancing it out, like nutrition and sleep and hydration and rest and how we can't just add more specific exercises to fix your exercise problem. And I had a suspicion in my head. My suspicion was that they were overconditioned. I thought their central nervous systems were sitting on the floor and going, oh. but they didn't have a way of saying that. They're hard workers. They, they're like, this is normal. So I said, let's study this population. Let's see what's going on. So background research, it says the answers have 42 to 97% injury prevalence. I was like, yep, that's pretty high. Um, it says that they should improve fitness with specific supplemental training, but it doesn't really say what they do, so no idea. And HRV is known to be modulated based off the amount of stress we put in. All the previous studies on athletes, all the previous studies on adult fitness enthusiasts said, if I match the exercise intensity to your HRV for the day, I will achieve superior fitness results and I will peak, meaning I will rest when I want you to rest and I will perform when I want you to perform at peak performance. A lot of it was out of Europe, there wasn't a lot out of the US, so all my background research was European based. Nothing had ever been tested on kids or teens, and these were teenagers. Okay, I'll set this population free. What do we do? We got 150 dancers to enroll, 134 of them finished the study. We did a randomized control trial, broke them into three groups. I trained them twice a week for six weeks on top of what they were already doing. And I had three different groups. One group did yoga with me. So I was like, all right, let's stress and digest. The other group did Tabata, high intensity training, very, very high intensity training. And the third group, I said, well, you go to Tabata today or you go to yoga today based off what your HRV says. And then we compared beforehand and after the study, what do your fitness measures say about you? So cardiovascular, like how do you perform on a beep test? It's basically an anaerobic endurance test. It's half anaerobic, half aerobic, depending on how you look at it. Then we looked at things like push-ups, crunches. We looked at how many squats can you do in a minute. So we looked at muscle endurance. We looked at balance as well. So then we said, okay, let's look at all the, all the differences that come out. What do you like stats or what do you don't like stats? What I did is I said beforehand and afterwards, who improved their fitness in all these areas? And we don't have to know anything about stats to see where did I accumulate the most pile of significant stats? Was it in my HRV, or uh, sorry, my first group is like high intensity, my second group is yoga, my third group is heart rate variability. Which group had the most improvements across all their fitness scores? Who accumulated the most numbers here? My mm -hmm. HRV group. My HRV group. How about my high intensity group? What happened to them? Not much, right? So here's what we discovered. All my groups got better at doing crunches. Okay, cool, that's nice. Tabata group, well they only improved at doing crunches, so really they weren't different than anybody else. So my Tabata group even when I added two days a week of high intensity training, which is what the coaches were asking me to do, they didn't improve any of their fitness scores at all. We would assume that increasing your baseline fitness would make you perform better, in theory. That's what the coaches thought. And this said, no, I don't think so. That's not what's actually happening here. My yoga group, they improved their cardiorespiratory fitness. That's intriguing because it doesn't make sense, right? Isn't it? specific training for specific outcomes. If I want to get better at cardio, don't I do cardio? It doesn't backwards. If I did yoga and your cardio got better. Huh, something's wrong. Here, central nervous system. Central nervous system. And my HRV group, they had improvements in just about every category except cardiovascular fitness. 
probably because I had bad problems as a kid. They were over-conditioned. They were over-trained. And those results make sense if they've been over-trained. How would I know they've been over-trained? By looking at their heart rate variability. No other measure would tell me that answer. So what I learned is matching intensity to pre-workout HRV increased fitness performance measures. We've seen that in the dancers, we've seen that in adult fitness enthusiasts, we've seen that in elite and also high level adult competitors and collegiate competitors across the world. So it is peaking their performance if we train their intensity to match their HRV for the day. Second thing, my yoga group normalized their, or they improved their cardiovascular endurance and they normalized the strength and power between their right leg to their left leg as measured by a single leg broad jump and a single leg triple jump. So that's a huge implication for sports medicine because that discrepancy, that difference, is what we think contributes to a whole lot of injuries. So when I regulated their central nervous system, it normalized. That was interesting. And we realized that technology can actually provide us insight into the concept of train smarter and not harder. Not just a saying, but actual insight that lets us do this. So it proved what other European countries had proved in terms of you match your exercise intensity, you peak your performance, you don't overtrain the athlete. So now, how's that work for you? And your shoes, especially your shoes. Consumer wearable technology. If you don't have it, your students do. This one I ripped off Fitbit. So this is Fitbit cell phone screenshot. And you see what these technologies are telling your phone. And these technologies are telling your phone numbers about heart rate variability. Depends on which technology you're using. But it will usually sample it at night. It'll usually sample it at the same time each night. And it'll usually decide whether you've had a restful enough sleep to make this make a difference. So it has some backside programming. So then it gives you these absolute numbers. But it also, you see a range in there and it says personal range, above range, below range. So you have numbers and you have a range and you have a trend. So now what am I supposed to listen to? I got three things. Which one is right? <laughs> They're all influenced by your age your gender, your size, your health, all your stress sources, and your circadian rhythm. So is 70 good? Is it 16 good? Is it 90 good? You guys can look at your heart rate and you can say, if it says 30 and I'm walking down the street, I've got some questions about it if you're about to be standing right now. You can look at it and says, if I wake up and it's 120, maybe I have a fever, but something's really wrong, right? So we understand the idea of heart rate, but am I supposed to do with this? I got all these moving targets. I got absolute trends, I got numbers, and it's all influenced by things that keep on moving. My age keeps on moving, my gender keeps on not moving. <laughs> my gender is not moving. My size can change, health can change, all your stress sources, your circadian rhythm can change. Okay, too many moving targets. So what we know about the consumer wearables, not necessarily the high level stuff being used in the hospital and the ICUs, but the consumer wearable technology, is that what I need to listen to? Is my trend in my zone? My absolute number, there isn't a good or bad. So if it's 100, if it's 17, it's, it's neither good or bad, it just is. And people have a hard time grasping that. They're like, oh, I wanna know if 76 is good. It's all about, are you in your zone? And it will track your trend over time, as long as it's not the same time each day, which your technology is designed to do now. So, here's what we know about this. This one was ripped off of, uh, I believe this is either a Whoop. I think this one's a Whoop, probably. And they put a smart interface on it. And they'll tell you, today you're red. And tomorrow maybe you're green. And maybe the next day you're yellow. So what does that mean when they put those consumer interfaces up there? Some of them have them, some of them don't. Green means, hey, you're ready to go. You actually have a low HRV. Red means, hey, you're not ready to go. You actually have a high HRV. And you're looking at that in ways, and you're like, wait, did you just say it backwards? Well, unfortunately, our society associates high with better and low with worse. So the technology interface flipped it over. Not all of them do that. It depends on which one you're working with. 
but most of them will give you like a red, yellow, green, or end zone, out of zone. And if you're green, it means, hey, I am good to go today. Challenge me. Let's do some high intensity training. Let's work my brain on a really hard project today. Let's have a team meeting that was probably going to be a struggle. It tells you, hey, I'm ready to go. My autonomic nervous system is in balance right now. If it's red, it's like, whoa. Autonomic nervous system is sitting on the floor like a little fizzled out brain with his hand in the air being like, please help. But we don't know it until we look at this. So if you don't have a red, yellow, green system, you have an end zone, out of zone system. Out of zone is basically saying red. End zone is basically saying green. So that's what all these wearable technologies are trying to tell us. They're giving us this new vital sign that we've never maybe thought about before and how it influences our life and how it influences our cardiovascular health. So what do I know? I know that you have a HRV, you have heart rate variability, whether you know it or not. We all have it. Nobody's immune from this one. Okay. Kind of like a blood pressure. We all have a blood pressure, even if you don't know your numbers. We know that the zone can be useful. If you're green or if you're in zone, it means challenge yourself. Even if you wake up and you're like, oh, I don't feel like doing that today. It's like, no, you're green today. Okay, because we know it doesn't correlate to perception. That's super interesting. Super interesting to look at that. And I actually have another study that we are kind of trying to work out, hopefully to get published, on the perception side of it, because the study had a lot of dimension. And if you're out of zone, saying, okay, today is your day to try not to stress out your nervous system. Don't go gardening and looking for snakes today, because you're going to end up running from them. And that's just going to take your heart rate variability in the direction that you didn't want to go in the first place today. Maybe save that for a day when you come up. I know that there's no correlation to any other vital sign that we know about. I know that there's no correlation to anything that we can measure right now, and there's no correlation to perception. So it is a unique identifier. It's another data point that maybe we consider if we want to. And we know that the HRV, rap is rap the, the HRV research is rapidly growing. We're seeing 2,000 new studies a year from around the world coming out. And what we think we have discovered it might be different tomorrow. Kind of like the number one diagnosis I was treating in clinic was hip labral tear, which 20 years ago, we didn't have an MRI to even run somebody through to even look for that thing. So we don't know. Medicine always changes. Research always changes. But this is what we know now. It's new treatment. And we know that with the consumer tech, <laughs> knowledge is not power. But knowledge, if you take action on it, is power. So if you say, yeah, I'm red today. I'm not going to go run a marathon today probably a good choice. If you say it's green, I'm going to do my high intensity stuff today, whether it's mental power or a stressful situation or a physical activity, that's probably your opportunity to make that work as best as it possibly could without stressing the rest of your resources and make your brain feel like it's running from the snake. And if we want to talk about cardiovascular statistics and the person on your right and your left, and if we are signing up for more cardiovascular disease today, uh, maybe I'll have this who knows what movie that's from? Mockingjay. <laughs> now I forgot what it's called. Oh, it's it's yeah, it's from Hunger Games. We all call it Mockingjay, right? I, I started saying Mockingjay. I keep Mocking Mocking saying that all the time. It's from Hunger Games. But we do know that having another data point seems to be a useful idea. We don't want to sign up for, I would like, more cardiovascular disease tests. And that's really all I have to share with you, so what do you want to share with me? How do I find my HRV? You, which you have Garmin, right? Yeah. Are you linked up to your device, like your your phone? Yeah. Okay. In there. Under heart rate. I haven't worked with the Garmin there. interface. Okay. Let's. I'll come over afterwards. Okay. We'll do that one. Okay. Yeah. Just because I haven't worked with the Garmin interface, so I might have to go searching for that one. Okay. Yeah, I worked with the Apple Watch interface, uh, and I've seen the Whoop interface and the other one. I think the sense is in there, but I haven't. Like, I'd be shocked if it isn't, yeah. unless you're, unless it's a really, really, really old Garmin. That's pretty. Okay. Yeah. yeah, let's look at for it afterwards. I'd be so surprised if it's not in there. And I know that my colleague from Building Twenty Eight, who does a ton of cycling, he's using Garmin, and it's on his for sure. Well, related to that, when you mentioned that fourteen or seventy, or what, what's the number? 
it's, it's the average for the last 30 days, but it seems like an average would get rid of the variability. It seems like you'd want the standard deviation, not the average. Do you know what I mean? Right. I, that. Yes. It's basic, when it gives you the zone thing, it's looking at more of the standard deviation around the moving target. Uh -huh. And then it looks at your trend to tell you whether you're in or out of zone. So if you only measure it once in a random blue moon, like you never wear this thing to bed, you're not going to have a very accurate, useful number. And your number, let's say it's 50 randomly, the number in and of itself would be very difficult to interpret. Right. It's the trend that we're after. Okay. Gotcha. And then they watch the trend and then they say, does the trend go out of zone or in zone? So they're looking at trend. So the number by itself is pretty arbitrary. Right, and depending on the company that made the technology, it totally depends. Because uh -huh. one company could say, we're gonna make this magic formula and turn it into 100, and the other one's, we're gonna make a magic formula and turn it into 10. And then somebody with this technology is comparing to that technology, and like, I have 100, I have 10. 100 must be better. I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, so we don't, absolute number-wise, on wearable consumer technology, it, it's not real useful. Hospital EKG, there's another technology level that goes into that one. Other thoughts, questions, ideas, shares? Did we learn something today that we did not previously have fully on our radar? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe you'll share it with some students too if they're wearing these wearable things. It's a, uh, like I said, it was a nightmare, right? <laughs> it's like you're dominant because you're published, you're just like, I have it, I'm glad I did it. It's like all research, it comes up and you're like, look at this cool dream. And then you start doing it and you're like, look at this nightmare, what did I dream <laughs> up? And then it actually gets to the point of getting through all the red lines and red lines and red lines that come back and all the rejections. And then it gets published and you're like, look at this cool dream. <laughs> took forever, but um, I'm glad, I'm glad it, I, I don't think I would ever take on something like that again, not as a primary investigator, and that was my first research study, I'll admit that, I was like, let's do a randomized control trial, why not, <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you might turn off building 28 and uh, <laughs> just turn off the room. Bye-bye, building 28.